Okay, so if you could pop the slides up, that would be great. I've just got a couple of slides uh, this morning. So as we were hearing and we're looking at that passage today uh, in Luke's Gospel, and we're going all the way from the Good Samaritan through Mary and Martha into Luke 11 with uh, Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. So it's quite a long passage. And <clears throat> it's, uh, it's the banner that I've given this week and next week is basically, it wasn't there, it's uh, still up there. It's basically uh, the living a life of purpose, power and poise in post-pandemic Scotland. I would have put post-pandemic Poland, but just to keep the alliteration going, but we're in Scotland, so it's gotta be Scotland at the, S, at the, at the end. But uh, I, I mean, we've been an incredible 16 months, haven't we, really? And I just wanna think about what it, what it means for us now, as we kind of come through the end of the pandemic, God willing, in, in the UK, as things start to open up. And I, I believe God is really wanting to speak to us right now. He, he's kind of shaken things up, hasn't he? He's, he's stopped a lot of things that we were doing. We, we've had to press the pause button uh, on a lot of our, our um, ministry and work and life and social. And I think God's wanting us to reboot our GPS, to press reset and maybe have new ways of doing things in the future that might look a little bit different to what we did in the old. And so what we're going to look at this morning and, and then next week is what it means to be a disciple in 21st century Scotland uh, in the midst of what is the fastest secularizing country in Scotland. I don't know if everyone appreciates that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that those of looking around this morning, those of you who are a little bit older would appreciate how much Scotland's changed in the last 40 years. And in the last 15 years, it's been phenomenal to see the rise of what you would call uh, progressive ethics, particularly uh, sexual ethics. And we've seen secular humanism take over education and the media and politics. And in our country, Christianity has been marginalized. We've been pushed further and further away from the center of what this country is all about. We're in the background now. And many of us, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm an exile anyway, because I'm from England. But I, I guess those of you who've grown up in Scotland, who love Scotland, you often feel like exiles in your own country these days, probably if you're a Christian and you live here and you've lived here your whole life. You, and if we look back in the Bible, we see that when the Israelites went to Babylon, they were in exile. I don't know if you do feel like you're in exile this morning. Uh, I, I do, as a Christian in this country, feel like sometimes uh, I don't belong, that I'm not wanted. What, what do we have to say in the midst of all that? Is there anything that we can say to this society? Is there anything that Jesus has to say that's still relevant of course there is. There's so much that we're going to look at today and next week that's relevant. And it's going to hopefully, I believe, show us how we live. What shape should our discipleship take in 2021? What would Jesus say to us in the midst of all these changes and disruptions? Well, as I said, this morning we're in Luke 25 to 11 verse 13. If you want to keep your Bible open uh, at, at that whole section, we're going to kind of look at it in three chunks and um, probably spend most of the time, 60% of it on the Good Samaritan, about 30% or less on uh, Mary and Martha, and then the rest on the last little bit. And what we've got here is uh, three requests of Jesus. So these are snippets that Luke's put together. He's not necessarily doing everything chronologically. He's putting themes together, as I'm sure you've picked up as you've gone throughout Luke. And there's a number of requests that have come to Jesus. Uh, we've got the lawyer in 1025 who comes and asks... Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We've got the hostess with the mostess in 10 verse 40, and we've got the disciples in 11 verse 1. But I'm not going to kind of go through all of these in, in detail and kind of do an exposition as you might do if you were just looking at one of these. I'm going to, if you like, kind of just touch on the surface. But what I do want to do is I want to unpack two major points of friction between our discipleship and 21st century Scotland, Okay. And broadly speaking, these are about division and distraction, division and distraction. And then I want to finish with a few thoughts on how we stand under, under such pressure, a theme we're going to come back to next week when Jesus really gets stuck into some of the leaders and Pharisees and um, there's some incredible verses next week. You, you don't want to miss that. That's my pitch to come back <laughs> next week. So the, the big idea, if you, if you want to jot this down, is the big idea of Jesus is the satisfaction for all of our heart's needs. Jesus is the satisfaction for all of our heart's needs. And let's start with the Good Samaritan, okay? Let's just jump right in there. 
The Good Samaritan is a very familiar story. I'm sure as it was uh, read just then and kind of uh, described, it was very familiar. Well, it's actually number 13 on the top 20 lists of Bible stories, according to the top10.com. And here's what they say about it, if you, if you can read that. They say, amazing way to teach others to be good. It shows what helping others can... This is straight off the internet, by the way, so you can, you can trust it. Um, <laughs> we must not only think of ourselves and walk away, but instead lend a helping hand. In doing so, you shall receive a blessing. One of the best and most universal stories that can teach troubled young people to improve their lives, communities, and personalities without forcing their religions or, or unexpected... Un, or, Unexpect, I can't even read it, it's such bad grammar. <laughs> or unexpecting others. I think it's a great story. It shows you that no matter who you are, you can be good. I like this one because it teaches us to help our enemies. It's getting great reviews. It's number 13 in the top 20. Very heartwarming. But I would say, actually, it misses the, the main point of what Jesus is trying to say here. Yes, there's something here about loving your enemies. That's very correct. But if you like, that's a wrapper for the punchline that Jesus is hitting this lawyer with. And the impact is much deeper and stronger and more profound. The question the lawyer asks is about being right with God. How do I become right with God, he says Jesus. And it's a question about the kind of life that's acceptable to God. How do I get in, he says. It's a good question. And perhaps, and I, I trust there are people asking that question this morning. Well, let's read it together. If you turn with me to Luke Chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. And as I say, it is a familiar passage um, as we read it. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave, him to the, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This lawyer between, this interaction between Jesus and the lawyer is fascinating. And I am going to uh, step into a dangerous territory here and talk about sport. Um, but it's perhaps not the sport you're thinking of. Because actually, it's, it's uh, tennis. <laughs> so today, today is the men's tennis final. And I don't know if you're into tennis, but uh, it's Wimbledon season, as you know. There was a ladies' final yesterday. And I'm going to uh, have Andy Murray playing the, the role of the lawyer here. And uh, just if, if you look at the pictures up there as we go through it. So the lawyer, he's, he's, he's kind of standing up to uh, serve. He's break down. It's, it's 1540. He's serving to, serving to stay in the set. He's 5-4 down in games. And he stands up to the baseline. The lawyer's first serve, he, he throws it up. And he serves Jesus the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, ret Jesus returns with a down the line, traditional Jewish response. What does the law say? What does God say? Love God and love your neighbor. All good. Strong return. And then it's another return from the lawyer back to Jesus again. Well, I've done this all my life. And the ball lands. Is it out? The umpire says the ball is good. Looks like it's hit the line. Jesus calls the Hawkeye review and up comes the graphic. But instead of a green tennis court and a yellow ball, it's a barren wasteland and a lump of flesh. And it's one of their own, a Jew, desperately in need of help. His life ebbing away, bleeding and broken. The crowd move instinctively closer. The children stop their playing. Everybody's listening to what happens next. The groans of the man drift across the valley. 
A fellow Jew is walking and comes into focus. He's a respectable person. They look, but they quickly pretend they had never seen. Another person comes, a leader of the people, but again he ignores the man's pain and walks on. Finally, as the groans fade to silence, a stranger walks up to investigate. They carefully wrap the wounds and clothe the body, lifting them onto their horse. They divert their own journey to the nearest town and buy lodgings for the week, full board, three meals every day. As they're watching this scene, the stranger looks this way into the camera and the crowd recognize him as their hated enemy, a Samaritan, a half-breed, that's what they called them, a diluter of the pure faith, a heretic. You see, there's a really important point here. The fact that Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero is like making him a German in a, in a story set in 1945. Or like making him a white middle-aged policeman in Fayetteville, North Carolina in May 2020. Jesus deliberately picked someone that his audience despised and made him the hero. Why? Because this is the type of love God expects. You see, I never thought of it before until I was preparing this passage, but Jesus could have made the Samaritan the victim and the Jew the hero. We don't know if this story was a literally true story or whether it was more like a parable with a story. We don't know if it was factual. But assuming that Jesus could have changed the roles, why didn't he have the Jew as the hero? Well, perhaps some of the audience would have thought, oh yeah, that's totally unrealistic. A Jew would never do that. Maybe they would dismiss it. Or they would maybe think that, well, that Jew, he might do it, but he's compromising his faith. He's not being pure to the faith. But by making the Jew the one in need, he puts the Jew in the Samaritan's debt, a place no Jew ever wanted to be. One of the books I've read a while back by Bernard Cornwall called Enemy of God about the life of King Arthur, he says in that you should never meet an enemy face to face, not if you know one day you'll have to destroy him. Never go and meet an enemy because actually you might, quite like to, you might quite like them when you meet them. You might start to get on and all of a sudden they might not be your enemy. The Jews' strategy with the Samaritans was avoidance. Stay away from the Samaritans. Don't speak to them. Don't go near them. Aggression. I wonder if we can relate to this at all in our nation today with those surrounding us who belong to a different camp or a different tribe or a different belief. God demands this kind of love every moment of every single day of everyone that we meet. That's what he expects. Who was the neighbor? It was the one you hate. Can you muster up that type of love by trying harder? Will you relentlessly, unconditionally, indiscriminately love the ones who ignore you, who malign you, mistreat you, tell lies about you, work to oppose you? Can you love like that? I can. It's impossible. So the Hawkeye review is over. The ball was out. It's long. He's lost the game in the first set. The lawyer is slumped on his, towel, on his chair with a towel over his head. Those of you who watch tennis are very familiar with that picture at the end on the right with Andy Murray. Bless him. The, the, the punchline Jesus wants us to hear is this. You can't do it. This is what he's trying to say. You can't love like this. At least not without the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you can't do it. How do you inherit eternal life? Well, Paul, you know, those of you who know your Bible, Paul later on in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he explains how you can do it. He says this, he says, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth and the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Do you spot that word again? Until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1 verse 13 and 14, Paul is saying, the presence of the spirit is the assurance of our inheritance. If you're a Christian today, if you have that spirit within you, that is the assurance. That's how you know you're, you're united to Jesus, how you're included in the inheritance. Do you see what it says? It says, we, we received when we believed. When we believed, we received the spirit. We were included in Christ as a down payment of what's to come later on. One thing we'll get the whole, one day we'll get the whole thing. You see, the point here that the Bible is making 
is that without our spiritual deposit changing our hearts, changing our lives, this is impossible. With the Spirit, it's only incredibly difficult. <laughs> That's the good news. It's still very, very hard to love people you despise. But it's possible with the Spirit. It's a divine miracle called grace. The power to love differently is an overflow of the Father's love in us as we bring ourselves in alignment with his heart and our heart. And it's the distinctive characteristic of the child of God. And I tell you, nobody in Scotland can love like that. You see, this kind of love cannot be self-generated by sinful and broken people. It can only be given, poured out from a pure source, poured out into our lives through the privilege of sonship from both daughters and sons. This is the spiritual deposit in our lives flowing out from the Father. I wonder who comes to mind when I think of, uh, if I ask you to think of the person you dislike the most. I'll give you a moment to think about that. Who comes to mind? God is putting his finger, we're going to hear more about the finger of God next week, but today God is putting our, his finger on our hearts about that person. He's saying to us, there is nobody outside of my love. Nobody. No, there is no one who deserves his love less than you do, less than I do. Nobody. And often it's those closest to us with whom we share such similar genes that we struggle to love the most, isn't it? Isn't it, brothers and sisters, how we struggle to love each other sometimes? It's crazy, but I think many of us struggle to love those inside the church as we see each other's faults so clearly. But we'll come back to that at the end. You see, this path of unconditional love is the path that Jesus is on as he goes on this path to Jerusalem that you're looking at in Luke's gospel. As he goes and he lays down his life for his friends, as he lays down his life for his enemies, as Paul says again in Romans 5, verse 6, he says, you see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we despised God, Christ died for us. No conditions, no them or us. This is the way of Jesus we're called to follow. What does this look like in our day? Do we shrink back and disengage from people that we dislike? Do we shun those that we despise? Or do we just accept whatever they believe? It doesn't really matter. We'll just be one big happy family. Are these the only two options? We must learn the difference between approval and acceptance. You see, if we're to reverse the marginalization of our faith in this country that we've experienced over the last 25 years that I have lived here, we can, we can accept people without having to approve of all of their choices in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, in our churches. I believe we're called to the hard balance of on the one side, lovingly affirming the areas where we can echo society's values. What are they? Well, we can say that every single person is unique, is special, is loved. Every single person. But at the same time, we need to confront the idols that society has put up above Jesus, where they've put self-love, self-determination, individualism as the gods of society. We need to affirm and confront, and we're going to see next week how Jesus does that in his own way. And then, by our own testimony and our own example, we will show people that every human being's highest satisfaction is found in one place, and one place only knowing Jesus. Secondly, and much more briefly, we'll look at Martha, the hostess, with the mostess to do, and Mary. And I've just got three quick lessons from this passage. So turn back to Luke uh, chapter, chapter 10 as we finish that chapter. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, 
Lord, don't you care my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You see, the life of a disciple is one of action, and it's one of meditation. A life of balance, lived in response to the mercy of God and the calling of God. And yet there are seasons, aren't there? There, is, there are tempos from God that we need to listen to and wait on him for. And wisdom is found in determining what is the tempo for this season. Am I, am I waiting on God or am I acting for God? And in this snippet, we've got Martha and Mary and Lazarus. <clears throat> we've got a right choice and we've got a wrong choice. And we can learn lessons from this, but we've got to avoid extremes. Jesus is not saying here that the contemplative life is for all time, for all situations, the best thing to do. I don't think he's saying that. We're not called to be hermits and monks and nuns. That's not our calling. We're called to the cut and thrust of raising families, changing nappies, attending the sick and the frail, teaching rowdy pupils, attending hectic meetings, Zoom meetings, Teams meetings, delivering difficult projects. That was, that's what we're called to in our lives. But in the midst of it is contemplation. So what can we learn? The first thing that Mary teaches us is that she saw the need of the moment was to listen. The need of the moment was to listen. In a very short time, Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem where he would die. This could have been the very well the last time he was in her house. So she's soaking it all up. She's listening. She's listening to everything he says. And I wonder this morning, what moments of sweet fellowship are we allowing our distracted lives to steal? How are we cultivating a habit of stillness, of silence? Would God speak to us more if he could get our attention, I wonder? The second thing is Mary took the posture of a disciple at the feet of her teacher. If you know your Bible, you'll know in Acts 22, verse 3, it talks about Saul, who was later Paul. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, who was the rabbi, the teacher, and Paul sat there at his feet, listening, learning from his teacher. Here, Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to her rabbi, her teacher. And in doing so, she's challenging the status quo of her day. In, in doing something normally reserved for men. Her love leads her to stepping across cultural barriers and norms in her devotion to God. Her need for intimacy with Jesus trumps her need to fit into the social conventions of her day. And there's no hint of inappropriateness here. No, it's quite the contrary. She's held up by Jesus as an honorable woman. She is doing the one thing needed. She takes her place amongst the men and listens, hanging on Jesus' every word. I wonder what we can do to honor and encourage women in our day. Mary is affirmed by Jesus in her devotion, such a powerful gift to receive and to give each other. And as I was preparing this, I felt God give me a message to speak over you today, uh, particularly to the, the women who are gathered here today. And he said this to me. He said, I affirm you today, you godly mothers, sisters, daughters, who sit at the feet of Jesus as equal in worth and equal in stature in the body of Christ. You are honored by Jesus and precious to him. I affirm your gifting and your service, your sacrifice, and your often silent suffering. God sees, God knows, God appreciates, God loves you. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, Jesus appreciates, Jesus loves you. Thirdly, on, on this section, distracted lives are unfruitful lives. Do you remember the parable of the sower in Matthew 13? And Jesus tells the story of all the seed that's sown and there's the ones amongst the thorns and it grows up but then it's choked and he says the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Someone once said to me, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. I was reading this, I'm reading this book at the moment. I know not all of you are in offices, but I'm technically in an office. I'm online every day and it's a world without email. Um, and it's really, really interesting 
and I'm trying to get my team to read it and somehow we can figure out how to get off this in incredible thing called email. And this might not apply to all of you. I know there's different professions here and everything, but I thought I'd read this out to you. This just gives you an idea of, the, of what it's like, what we're training our, ourselves to, to be like as being so distracted. A report from the summer of 2018 analyzed behavior data from 50,000 active users. And these were people who had a piece of software on the computer that were tracking where they were going, looking at their email, doing a bit of work. They were, it was tracking what they were doing during a working day. It reveals that half of these users were checking communication applications like email and Slack every six minutes or less. Indeed, the most common average checking time was once every minute. 50,000 people every single minute, the most common, with more than a third of people checking their inbox every three minutes or less. Keep in mind that these averages are likely inflated because they include lunch breaks and one-on-one -on -one meetings in which the subjects were presumably away from the computer screens. But if you know anything about Teams calls, people are still checking their email on, on the call when you're looking at them. To help understand the true scarcity of uninterrupted time, this is, this is the bit I wanted to think about. Uninterrupted time, right? Devotion. The, the data scientists calculate the longest interval that each user worked with no email inbox checks or instant messaging. For half the user studied, the longest uninterrupted interval was no more than 40 minutes in their entire day. More than two thirds of the users never experienced an hour or more of uninterrupted time during the period studied. We are living lives of distraction. Every human being's highest satisfaction is found in one place and one place only, knowing Jesus. Perhaps you're thinking this sounds like hard work. Loving people we don't like, struggling to cultivate deep devotion sounds like a lot of tough work. Where does the power to do this come from? Well, we're going to find it in chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, where the power comes from. And just briefly, I want to touch on these verses. And we'll come back to some of this next week. So we're not going to do them justice now. But I want to read, actually, if you just leave your Bibles, I want to read from the message, verses 2 to 4 in the message. And this is what Eugene Peterson writes. He says, when Jesus was asked, how do we pray? So he said, when you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You see, when we're praying, reveal who you are. This is the reality that we're embracing and welcoming. This is the type of love we're opening ourselves up to. Lord, reveal who you are in my place in this country right now. When we pray, keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. This is the type of love for the loveless that God is calling us into. We have here the disappointed lawyer, the lawyer who came to Jesus seeking purpose, but finding a demand for perfection. We have the distracted hostess questioning priorities and receiving a rebuke for distraction. And now we've got the eager disciples looking for some sort of pattern for prayer and being shown true power. Three needs, three people with three needs coming to Jesus to meet them, leaving with the truth. And what's to be our path this morning? Will we craft a life <clears throat> of purpose, power and poise? If so, it, be one, it will be one of earnest seeking, focused attention and boundary breaking it will bring hardship. It will bring conflict. It will bring rejection. But it will also bring fruit. And it's a posture of relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. You're going to look at Luke 15 in a few weeks. And that image of that Father, the open-hearted, open-armed, delighting, seeking Father of the prodigal son. You'll come to it. Look forward to it. This is the type of father that Jesus is saying, pray to the father, reveal yourself, reveal you what you're like. He's wanting you to seek him in prayer and in your prayer life. If we expect our parents to give us the right gifts, how much more our heavenly father? In verses 10 and 13 of chapter 11, again in the message, it says this, don't bargain with God, be direct, ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. 
If your little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him with a live snake on your plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. And don't you think the Father who conceived you in love will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him? Of course he will. This is a posture of dependence. No hidden sin. No bitter root. No selfish pride. An open-hearted, open-handed, open-faced posture of devotion and waiting on the Lord. Today is the day to come to him if you, if you are not in that right relationship. That healthy, horizontal and vertical relationship with God and with other people. Today is the day to come and find that every human being's highest satisfaction is found in one place and one place only, knowing Jesus. Be open-hearted towards God. Cleansed from our sin, poised and ready. The power will descend the purpose will be revealed. God isn't finished with you yet. He's not finished with this country yet. Absolutely not. The most powerful means of transforming our society is a church overflowing with unconditional love, coming from disciples filled with the Holy Spirit. Or as a friend of mine said uh, recently, the world is waiting for a church that is madly in love with itself. If you can't love you, that those that we can see who are on the same team, what hope to love those who oppose us? You know, if COVID has taught us one thing, it's how precious community is. Loving each other, serving each other, forgiving each other. As we close, I want to share this poem with you that I wrote uh, in January this year. And I, I want to leave it as a, as a prayer I wrote it as my prayer for the year and I want to leave it as a prayer with you over this service. And it's called Learn to See. Father, help me to see the church as it should be. Not as it is now, but as you see. No longer regard people from a human point of view. See with God's eyes how we will be made anew. See the bursts of glory all around. Exchange the errors for the profound. See the pot potential in others, sin in myself. Forgive, forget, restore back to health. Bless others, he says, as you have been blessed. Unconditionally, relentlessly, indiscriminately, I confessed. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we pray over this service, your blessing. We are your children, Lord. We look to you. Would you give us a snake if we ask for an egg? No, you wouldn't, Lord God. We look to you to bless us, to lead us and guide us, to make us full with your spirit for those who don't know you, that they would come to see you today and that we would love each other with the depth and the fullness of the love of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. To find out more about Teesside Christian Fellowship, visit tcfperth.org.uk. Together, we worship Jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say.